šta sam, nisam mogla ništa raditi, šta će ležala sam ne, on me je silovan jer nije bilo načina nekoga da se ja odbranim i pak nisam mogla da shvatim šta mi se dešava. Kako da ne, ja sam plakala majko moja šta doživi, šta se ovo dešava. Armed conflict, the conquest of people and possessions. Battles throughout history have always left a significant toll on the civilian population, especially the women and children. Although they were typically not involved in combat, women had to silently endure rape, torture, and sexual enslavement, despicable acts so commonplace in wars. Sexual violence goes with war as if it were to accompany war all the time, cannot be separated from war. And I think at times that's used to excuse its presence, to say, well, it's like the poor will always be with you. Sexual violence will always be there at war. On the other hand, we talk about sexual violence, and particularly rape, being used as a weapon of war, which to a certain extent shows that it's just not something that accompanies war. It's part of the destructive acts of war. In 1907, the international legal community recognized the need to protect women in armed conflict and gathered in the Netherlands for the Second Peace Conference where they adopted the Hague Conventions. In Article 46 of the Conventions, a provision was written that states, family honor and rights to be respected. This noble but subtle attempt was simply not enough to deter the mass rapes that were committed during World War I and World War II. After World War II, the international community once again tried to address serious war crimes by holding two multinational tribunals, Nuremberg and Tokyo. There were some grave injustices addressed at these tribunals, but charges for rape and sexual violence were barely touched upon. That has happened uh, throughout time, uh, that, wi that women have been uh, the victims uh, of, of war through rape but it has not been recognized. In Nuremberg, it was just blinked at. In 1949, the Geneva Conventions were adopted, containing a very specific provision prohibiting rape. Article 27 states, women shall be especially protected against any attack on their honor, in particular against rape and forced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. Although the provision classified rape as a matter of honor rather than as a violent crime, the inclusion of rape was still significant. Placing sexual violence within the context of serious violations of humanitarian law really tells you that sexual violence is a crime during war. To date, more than 190 countries have ratified this convention, yet acts of sexual violence continue to be a persistent feature during armed conflicts around the world. As war engulfed the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, reports from the region highlighted horrific stories of systematic sexual abuse of civilians. These stories were so widespread that the international community was compelled to take action. In 1992, the United Nations mandated a commission of experts to investigate and document these allegations on the ground. The Commission's report was unequivocal. Sexual assault and rape have been carried out by some of the parties so systematically that they strongly appear to be part of a policy. The extent to which women were raped was so great. It's because it was being done with impunity, because the soldiers or the authorities knew that no action would be taken against uh, the rapists and that the women's voices would never be heard by anybody. The reports that circulated around the world sparked a passionate outcry to stop this wartime victimization. And many became dedicated to putting this pressing issue squarely on the agenda of policymakers. Judge Florence Mumba was a member of one such group. At that time, the uh, UN Commission on the Status of Women was sitting in New York. And it was actually during one of the sessions that the Commission decided that uh, they should draft a resolution to be passed on to the Security Council, creating a new crime, a new war crime of rape. 
On the 25th of May, 1993, the Security Council unanimously passed Resolution 827 establishing the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The serious violations of international humanitarian law, which have been taking place in the territory of the former Yugoslavia, have outraged the conscience of humanity. А виновные, к какому бы лагерю они ни принадлежали, должны понести заслуженное наказание. The lesson that we are all accountable to international law may have finally taken hold in our collective memory. This will be no victor's tribunal. The only victor that will prevail in this endeavor is the truth. Immediately, the administrative process of setting up this international court began. Judges from around the world were elected and rules of procedure and evidence were adopted. Specifically, Rule 96 was designed to safeguard the integrity of the victims of sexual violence by narrowing the permissible defenses for those crimes. No corroboration shall be required. Consent shall not be allowed as a defense if the victim was under duress. And prior sexual conduct of the victim shall not be admitted into evidence. I think that the rules provided um, an atmosphere uh, for the receipt of evidence that is absent in national systems. The rules we considered um, really um, contained the highest international standards as they relate to that issue. Evidentiary material collected during investigations in the region was delivered to the newly formed Office of the Prosecutor. When we first arrived, um, the office was still in the throes of being set up. Um, the Deputy Prosecutor had, in essence, been here by himself for sort of two to three months, trying to set the office up, trying to get across the magnitude of the crimes. Um, and one area, um, of the Commission of Experts report was sexual violence um, that um, he believed um, had to be investigated. What happened on the 22nd of August 1994? Yeah. First of all, I think when our investigators uh, from the Office of the Prosecutor understood that this was just part of their investigative mandate. Look at the killings, look at the lootings, look at the buildings being burned, look at the sexual violence that occurred. The path towards prosecution of sexual violence was not always straightforward, and reminders were necessary to ensure the full implementation of this tribunal's mandate. A policy which has commonly become to be described as ethnic cleansing was executed in Priador. In this connection, it is extremely important to remind that rape has been listed for the first time in the history of the humanitarian law as a crime. So it is very important that the indictments you are considering to issue clearly describe all the different elements of the ethnic cleansing <laughs> policy. There will be no justice unless women are part of that justice. Um, so yeah, from that point of view, it wasn't like your normal investigation where you just go out with the information at hand and then you just start your interview and you go through. These are very, very special investigations and they have to be handled with diplomacy, with sensitivity, with aplomb. Investigations reveal the complexities of sexual violence, which include sexual enslavement, torture, and sexual mutilation. As we look at sexual violence in war today, we know that it's even much more complicated. It's an issue that's used against men, um, not infrequently. Men are sexually assaulted because what a better way to demoralize, you know, the brigade that charged the hill than to capture those men and then publicly have them commit fellatio upon each other. Uh, it's, it's a weapon It's because it goes to the very psyche of the person, it goes to a physical sense of the person, it goes to a social sense of the person. It's a very uh, adequate manner in which the person somehow feels that they've experienced a death and yet are condemned to continue to live. The first ICTY trial began on the 26th of April, 1995, with a low-ranking Bosnian Serb politician called Dusko Tadic, 
accused of crimes committed in detention camps around the town of Priador. How do you plead to the indictment, guilty or not guilty? Nisam kriv i nisam učestvao ni u jednom od dijela koje mi se stavio na teret iz optužnice. And I understand then you're pleading not guilty to each of the charges. Is that correct? Da. Thank you. The Tadic case was pioneering in more ways than one. Not only was it the first war crimes trial conducted by an international court since World War II, it was also the first trial to include charges of sexual violence in the form of sexual mutilation. The Tadic case presented really the, the, the first case of sexual violence, and uh, it involved not sexual violence against a woman, but sexual violence against a man. And uh, in that case, um, we were called upon to decide whether or not the accused was guilty of having participated in a, in a horrific act. Gemoral, sagnuti sem meču noge njegove. Naređeno mu je da grize. Spolni organ. Kada sam drugi put pogledao tih trenutaka je javuk kriska urlici. Kada sam drugi put pogledao G ustao je sa punim ustima ne mogu znati šta je bio je sav krvav. After hearing evidence for 79 days, the trial chamber found that because Tadić was present during this sexual violence, he was guilty of aiding and abetting the crime. For this and other crimes he committed, the trial chamber sentenced him to 20 years of imprisonment. The chamber found that on 10 separate occasions, you beat, stabbed, and kicked 19 Muslim men in Khazarats, the Priador barracks, and the Ormaska and Karaturm camps and you aided it and abetted it in the beating of one Muslim prisoner and the sexual mutilation of another at the Armaska camp. The first hurdle for convicting those who had committed acts of sexual violence had been overcome, and a number of cases followed that began to expand the existing legal understanding of the term sexual violence. Gender crime could go toward forms of sexual mutilation and we've already put forward evidence of that, and we received convictions at the Yugoslav Tribunal for mutilation of genitalia. Uh, there's evidence of mutilation of other parts of the body. Gender crimes could go to forced nudity, male and female, being forced to remain in a state of nudity within a public sphere because they are members of the other side of a conflict. Where a gender crime could just go to threatening your physical integrity, or forcing you to watch someone else who is being sexually assaulted and sexually violated. Vojnik Okrenovo Sečavić tome mladiću i rekao mu je Skidaj se. Go. Nek svi vide. Dječak je plakao. Počeo da ga udara i da trga sa njega košulju koju je imao. Strgoje košulju, onda mu je ovim riječima rekao što ja nikada u svom životu nisam čuo. Sad ću te natjerati da siluješ svoju mrtvu majku. Poslije ti riječi ljudi koji su bili uz azid škole, pokušali su da napuste školu, da napuste zid, da bježe unutra. Ali drugi vojnik je tako oštro reagao i rekao je sjedi i gledajte koji se bude mrdao bit će ubijen. Mi smo morali da gledamo. Odjednom sam čuo pucanje i pogledao sam kako je dječak pao pored svoje majke. The case that followed concerned a detention facility for Bosnian Serbs set up on the banks of the Naretva River near the village of Celebici. In this infamous camp, acts of sexual violence frequently occurred. There were three men, two Bosniaks and one Croat, who would ultimately be held responsible. 
The deputy camp commander of the facility, Hazem Delich, was charged with repeatedly raping two female detainees. Who was it who, who raped you? Ovaj u štakama što je bio čovjek. Do tada još nisam znala ko je. Okay. Okay. Poslije sam saznala, već ubrzo smo saznali ko je i šta je. Ali nažalost, zgazio mi je ponos. Više ne mogu nikad sebi da dođem, da budem žena kao što sam bila. The sexual violence in the camp didn't only come in the form of rape. Um, do you remember any other incident, any other mistreatment of other prisoners? Osjećam se još, bila su dvojica braće, Đorđić i Vasa i Vesel. I mislim tu, bio je tu i tada i gospodin Delić. Tad su oni natjerali su i da se šamaraju tuku jedan drugoga. I onda je Zenga natjerao braću da jedan drugome s oproštenjem polni organ. Mislim, to je žalosno i ponižavajuće. To sam vidio, mislim, od tatiranja i zlostavljanja. Mislim što to čovjek normalan ni u kom slučaju ne bi mogo da uradi. Mislim, to je stvarno grozno šta se je radio. Mislim, to su bili ljudi nedužni i I bez ikakvog razloga tako su zastavljali. Mr. Dagrinić, do not feel uncomfortable. Let's say exactly what they were forced to do. Oni su morali jedan drugome sa izvinjenjem da puše polne organe. Na očigled svi u nas u Angar koji smo bili. Esad Lanjo was subsequently convicted for this inhumane treatment. As the camp commander, Mutsic was also convicted for this crime, as well as additional crimes that were committed by his subordinates. This is the first elucidation of the concept of command responsibility by an international judicial body since the cases decided in the wake of the Second World War. In reading out the judgment, the trial chamber also specified that Delic committed rapes in order to punish his victims, and therefore his crimes could also be defined as torture. A calculated cruelty in the torture and mistreatment of many others. You raped two defenseless women on several occasions, seeking to exert your power over them and instill absolute fear in them. The trial chamber considers the rape of any person to be a despicable act, which strikes at the very core of human dignity. An extremely important confirmation. Rape can constitute torture. This legal precedent for the tribunal could now be used as jurisprudence for other cases yet to come. Two years after the first trial began, this international court became the first to conduct a trial exclusively on charges based on sexual violence. The case involved a local commander of the Bosnian Croat Army in the Lashva Valley, Anto Furungia. He was charged with two counts of torture and outrages upon personal dignity, including rape. At that point, this man, Sisko, demanded that witness A undress. She did so to a point of complete nudity and then said that this man began to stroke her naked body with a knife and threatened to insert it into her vagina if she did not tell the truth. And then, after that, commenced raping her by both vaginal and oral penetration. During this, Your Honours, the accused is alleged to have persisted with his interrogation questions. He did not stop questioning her whilst this was happening. Although Ferungia did not inflict this sexual violence himself, the trial chamber found that his failure to stop the attack being committed in his presence made him responsible for the crime. This judgment further solidified 
the link between sexual violence and other violent crimes. The trial chamber finds it is indisputable that rape and other serious sexual assaults in situations of armed conflict entail criminal liability of the perpetrators. In this context, the trial chamber upholds the recent finding by trial chamber two of the ICTY in prosecutor versus the Lalich and others that in certain circumstances, rape may amount to torture under international law. The trial chamber added that rape may also amount to a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, a violation of the laws or customs of war, or an act of genocide if the requisite elements are met. With this decision, the trial chamber also confirmed the recent finding of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. The ICTR, set up in Arusha, Tanzania, was to prosecute crimes committed during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. The court shares a similar mandate to that of the ICTY, and both share the same appeals chamber. While giving testimony in the Akiesu trial, witnesses began to recount stories of multiple rapes. Although the original indictment did not contain charges of rape, it became evident to the trial chamber that systematic sexual violence had occurred and could not be ignored. I was with my daughter, who had been raped. When was she raped? They raped her when they had come to kill my father. How many men did rape your daughter? Three men. Three men. Was this question ever put to you by the investigators of the tribunal? No, in my pa No, they did not ask me this question. How old was your daughter? Elle était âgée de six. She was six years old. Judge Pile describes the impact that this testimony had on the trial chamber. What went through my mind is this mother speaking about a six-year-old being raped and we asked her if she knew who did it, she named them. And immediately what struck me and also the other two judges is why hasn't this been investigated? Because we are here to dispense justice, justice to victims. So all serious crimes should be investigated. We don't want to hear that, that there's lack of resources or they don't have women investigators. So frankly, that is the first thing that went through my mind. But I felt that as a judge, we couldn't influence the way cases are investigated. But in our courtroom, we control our courtroom and we can draw out that kind of evidence. The indictment was eventually amended and the Akiyesu trial became the first case in the history of international law to convict an individual of rape as an instrument of genocide. It was the ICTR that, that, that produced a groundbreaking decision with respect to sexual violence against women. Uh, it is the ICTR that held that rape can constitute a crime of genocide. That's terribly significant uh, because we know that rape is a tool of war. It's not an isolated act or several isolated acts. It's used as a tool of war. And in this instance, it was used as a tool of genocide. And that has significantly advanced the jurisprudence of uh, this whole area of, of the law. The successes of the first six years of prosecuting crimes of sexual violence had put the ICTY in a solid position to tackle the challenges which lay ahead. In the year 2000, three accused stood trial for charges that were again exclusively related to acts of sexual violence. Jagolyub Kunarats, Radomir Kovac, and Zoran Vukovic were each charged with crimes committed in the eastern Bosnian town of Foča in the early years of the war. Through the horrific stories revealed by the survivors, this town has now become identified with rape being used as a tool of war. The trial chamber will hear that women and children, some, as I said earlier, as young as 12 years old in Focha, were detained and raped, vaginally, anally, and orally, subjected to gang rapes, forced to dance nude with weapons pointed at them, and even enslaved. Hundreds of women were held in various locations scattered around the town where soldiers, reservists, paramilitaries, and sometimes even local civilians would sexually abuse them. Charges included rape, torture, 
and for the first time in history, account of sexual enslavement as a crime against humanity. One of the many victims, who was 15 years old at the time, was captured and held by the accused as a sexual slave for nine months and eventually sold for 500 Deutschmarks. Are you able to count how many times you were raped in Karaman's house? In an attempt by the defense to prove that the girls were willing participants, Kunrats testified on his own behalf and gave this version of the events. Though it was not against your will, actually, you were not raped by the witness, were you? Nije primijenila nikakvu silu na pitanje časne sudinice. Da li me ta osoba zavela? Da li to tumačim kao zavođenje? Ja sam i tada rekao da mogu da tvrdim da nije silovanje. Da me nije silovano na bilo kakav način. Ali ona je sigurno, tvrdim, 10, 15 ili 20 minuta mene i ljubila i mazila i učinila sve da bi me kao muškarca nadražila. Despite this attempt, the trial chamber was satisfied that DB did not freely consent to any sexual intercourse with Kunarats. She was in captivity and in fear for her life. Consent is not a defense under certain circumstances, at least that was the final and current version of, of the rules. And that is if a person is subjected to duress or, or fear, um, uh, or if, as we later provided, if they fear that members of their family will be subjected to some sort of coercion or threats. So that it's just not foreseeable that consent could be a defense when a woman is in such a coercive uh, and life-threatening situation uh, in a war. Witness after witness came forward. A pattern emerged of sexual violence that was systematic widespread and used as an instrument of terror. Women would be raped by so many soldiers over several days or months, in some cases even years, as was the case in Kunaras. What the evidence shows are Muslim women and girls, mothers and daughters together, robbed of their last vestiges of human dignity. Women and girls treated like chattel, pieces of property at the arbitrary disposal of the Serb occupation forces and more specifically, at the beck and call of the three accused. The conviction of Kunarats for enslavement based on the evidence of sexual violence was one of the most significant aspects of the judgment. This was the first time sexual enslavement was recognized as a crime against humanity. Another hurdle had been overcome in the path toward justice for victims. You not only mistreated women and girls yourself, but you also organized their transfer to other places where, as you were fully aware, they would be raped and abused by other soldiers. This behavior calls for a severe penalty commensurate with the gravity of your crimes. The trial chamber therefore sentences you, Dragoyev Kunaras, to a single sentence of 28 years imprisonment. The prosecutor's pyramid approach of investigating crimes of sexual violence and indicting those responsible had begun to pay off. The prosecution could now use the evidence and jurisprudence developed from completed trials to link these crimes to high-level political and military leaders. You'll never stop all crimes, will you? No. But if you can make leaders think twice or three times, before they systematically organize these kind of crimes or fail to take action to punish these, these kind of crimes, then you are beginning to address impunity. Biljana Plavšić, 
one of the five top leaders of the Bosnian Serb War Presidency, was indicted for orchestrating a campaign of persecution which was carried out by her subordinates. In 2002, the only woman ever indicted by the ICTY for war crimes accepted responsibility and pleaded guilty to one count of persecution that included sexual violence. Sada sam se uvjerila i prihvatam da su više hiljada nevinih ljudi bili žrtve organizovanog i sistematičnog djelovanja da su ukrolone muslimani i hvati sa područja koje su srbali, Srbi smatrali svojim. U to vrijeme ja sam olako ubjedila samu sebe da je ovo pitanje opstanka i samoodbrane. U stvari više od toga, naše rukovodstvo i čiji sam bila neophodan dio, vodilo je poduhvat koji je za žrtve imao nebrojne nevine ljude. What the tribunal has done, I believe, uh, first just by listing rape as a crime against humanity, but secondly by prosecuting it and by developing the jurisprudence of sexual violence, is that the leaders of these conflicts are now put on notice that the rules have changed. Unraveling the complexities of sexual violence during the armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia was only possible through the determination of those who came forward to tell their stories. I am here to tell the truth that I am talking about the people and the people of the people. And I wanted to say the truth and to know the truth of what was done. Did it have to happen to us that we had to do something that happened to us? These women, primarily, um, are enormously courageous to come and testify under very difficult conditions because you think about it, rape is a, the most personal of crimes and you sit in the courtroom across from the person who's raped you. We had quite a number of uh, witnesses who gave evidence in open session, especially in the uh, Kunara's case. And uh, they came, they were very willing, and e even uh, during the time that we were giving evidence that they were determined to tell the truth because they wanted justice to take its, uh, its course. And they also said because they, uh, the, the trial chamber gave them a free platform to tell the world what had happened to them. What I think people hadn't imagined, and, and how could they, given the newness of this endeavour, was to the incredible and overwhelming logistical um, nightmare whirlwind of trying to bring people from dozens of different countries, one of them a war-torn post-ex-Yugoslavia, internationally in and out of The Hague to be able to testify. So it was always imagined that witnesses would be traumatised, that it would be difficult and that they should have support. The pioneering efforts of the Victims and Witnesses section have become an important part of the legacy of the Tribunal in successfully prosecuting sexual violence. So witnesses would say to me, I've been asked to testify, I'm ready to testify, but I can't because I've got three children under five. The childcare policy was born. I want to testify, I'm ready to testify, but I can't, I look after my elderly disabled father. The dependent person's policy was born. I want to come, but I can't. I earn five Deutschmarks a day. It's all our family's got to live on. The attendance allowance policy was born. So all our support um, programs or the things that make it possible for witnesses to testify without further suffering or harm grew out of listening to witnesses to understand what it was that they needed. As a result of all the rapes that you suffered during these many months, did you continue to suffer? The successes of the ICTY and the ICTR have started to resonate throughout the international justice system, proving that the rule of law works and remains a key tool to address wartime sexual violence around the world. 
international humanitarian law, for the most part, was on paper and not applied before this tribunal was established. Today, you can't say that. This, this tribunal has a long record. The ICTR has a, a long record. The ICC, although in its infancy, is beginning to establish itself. There's Sierra Leone. There's extraordinary chambers uh, in uh, Cambodia that's been established. There are international judges sitting in various uh, parts of the world. These new courts can now confidently address the crimes of rape and sexual violence based on this tribunal's extensive contribution to the development of jurisprudence in this area. The statute and rules of the ICTY have now been tested as legitimate and enforceable. Humanity normally moves forward, so we can't subtract from what we have got at this stage. So uh, future tribunals, if any, and even the ICC itself may improve upon its statute by, by, by being more specific with these offenses. The path towards justice for victims of sexual violence has now been clearly set. National jurisdictions, including those in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, have begun to play a significant role in the global effort to end the impunity of those responsible for these crimes, committed against our humanity. I think we probably have seen an enormous impact in the long term. That impact is not complete yet, but you're beginning to see it. For example, I'll, I talked about the 11 BIS cases, the indicted cases we transferred down. Now, uh, in the prosecutor's office, we're handing over dossiers, materials, investigative materials, and so forth for local prosecutors, not just in the state court in Bosnia, but throughout the region to bring prosecutions. You may ask yourself, you know, has this really had an impact? The reality of it is the crimes related to gender-based violence are now very explicitly spelled out in the ICC statute. In the long run, I think it will serve as a deterrent. And if nothing else, I think punishing perpetrators is uh, giving back to the victims some of their dignity that has been taken away, if it's only that. I think the international community has a responsibility uh, first and foremost to persuade the leadership, uh, uh, the political leadership of each member state to bring it to the attention of their nations or their people or their military forces as to what is going on. and. Uh, what is up to date in terms of uh, uh, cases like rape and other war crimes in, in the uh, way we are trying to protect the women. You will not find a body of law that's, I would say, one-eighth as lengthy about sexual violence under international criminal law than you have with just compiling maybe five or six of our cases together. There's been more jurisprudence out of our tribunal in five years than in the past 500 years from international criminal courts. And what they've contributed overall is basically placing the sexual violence in its legal context. The jurisprudence of ICTY and ICTR, I believe, to a certain extent, will deter the future commission of these horrific crimes of sexual violence because the would-be perpetrators are put on notice that the rules have changed, that if they commit these acts, they do so at their peril and that they will at some time appear in the dock of an international tribunal.